Hello and welcome to part two of chapter four of my Catholic and non-woke superhero novel, Task. Let's begin. Matthew had developed a system of caring for Maggie after a good deal of trial and error. It boiled down to three things, exercise, hygiene, and nutrition. But first came the tarp. Matthew created a short-lived portal and retrieved the larger duffel bag from his prep room. It was completely dedicated to holding a huge canvas tarp that Matthew draped over Maggie's bubble with his power. Out of respect for her privacy, Matthew shielded her from view. He cared for her purely with the heightened sense of his power he experienced within the phenomenon. Once the tarp was in place, Matthew carefully removed the IV needle from Maggie's right arm, cleaned and disinfected the area, and applied water-resistant bandages. Then it was time for exercise. Maggie's body moved regularly each day of its own accord, very much like someone might toss and turn while sleeping. These movements were helpful to stave off atrophy and other physical problems, but more needed to be done to keep Maggie healthy. Matthew discovered by accident that Maggie's body was very prone to reflexive movement in its current state, and he would use his power to stimulate different muscle groups each day to give her something akin to a workout. He was able to increase the weight Maggie's muscles fought against, too, and the result was that Maggie was at least as fit as she was before the creation of the phenomenon. After the exercise routine, Matthew would use his power to portal away Maggie's white tracksuit, which was more or less identical to the ones he and Sam were wearing, and then help her body eliminate waste, which it would not do without assistance. A small portal leading to a toilet set aside for the purpose worked perfectly. Maggie currently did not have any feminine hygiene needs, so Matthew opened small portals at the very top and bottom of Maggie's bubble to facilitate giving her a shower. Matthew portaled shampoo, soap, and washcloths from the small duffel bag into Maggie's bubble, and then used his power to wash and rinse her body. Her hair was long and thick, but Matthew's control over his power inside the phenomenon allowed him to remove the water from it and the rest of the surface of Maggie's body with minimal difficulty. He portaled the used shower kit into a plastic bag, and then back into the small duffel bag. Another use of a portal enabled Matthew to remove Maggie's clean clothes, another white tracksuit with sensors sewn into it, from the small duffel bag and quickly dress her with his power. Nutrition was the most difficult part of the routine. Matthew took out the large IV bag and its kit of associated materials and portaled them into Maggie's bubble. He very carefully searched for the opening in the arm of Maggie's tracksuit, left arm this time, before using his power to gently insert the needle and secure... Uh, this is... Before using his power to gently insert the needle and securing the entire... Yeah, using and securing, yeah. And I, just, I must have just come at it weird. Let's try it again. He very carefully searched for the opening in the arm of Maggie's tracksuit, left arm this time, before using his power to gently insert the needle and securing the entire IV kit with medical tape. Every two weeks, Matthew would switch the IV site from one arm to the other in an attempt to do as little damage as possible to Maggie. But it made exercise and hygiene more complicated on days when there was no switch. He was grateful today was a switch day. Matthew took Maggie's lunchbox out of the duffel bag and her meal out of the lunchbox. It was a large pouch full of highly nutritious but unappetizing looking greenish paste, still cold. Very cautiously, Matthew portaled small amounts of the nutrition paste into Maggie's mouth and then helped her to swallow it so that her full digestive system would receive some activity. He followed up each serving with a sip of water. After he repeated that process several times, he portaled the rest of the contents of the pouch directly into Maggie's stomach. He then brushed Maggie's teeth, rinsed out her mouth, rinsed and dried her face, returned all the used items to the small duffel bag, and then removed the tarp and returned it to the large duffel bag. Now he and Samantha would wait for the IV to finish. Thanks for being so patient, Sam, Matthew said when he was done. She was sitting on the ground a few feet away from the bags. He went and sat next to her. You're welcome, but I was not all that patient, Matthew, she said. I called your name a few times, but you were so focused on task, you didn't hear me. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam, Matthew said. I have to be so precise when I take care of Maggie, and my power is so amped up in here, it's almost like it overwhelms my other senses. I'll take your word for it, Sam said. Hey, remind me why you don't put sunscreen on her. Her bubble filters out UVs. Seems to do that for free radicals, pathogens, and anything else harmful, too. Gotta say something about temperature. And 
keeps the temper. Yeah. What would it keep it? I don't know. Do I need to say? I say keeps the temperature constant. I don't think we need to say a particular amount or number. All right, let's do that over. Her bubble filters out UVs. Seems to do that for free radicals, pathogens, and anything else harmful too. And it keeps the temperature constant. Like your null field, Sam said. Seems so, Matthew replied. This whole thing, Matthew said, gesturing all around. Oh, all around. I think that should be all around. Yeah, that shouldn't be. That should be all around. Let's make it correct. Gesturing all around. Yeah. Seems so, Matthew replied. This whole thing, Matthew said, gesturing all around, is some kind of weird marriage of my powers with hers. Not a very happy one, Sam said. You should get a divorce. I wouldn't put things quite in those terms, Matthew said. But yes, I'd like for this to be over. I really want Maggie to wake up. Especially given your relationship status now, Samantha said. She had her chin resting on her chest and was looking at him over her shoulder. Patience may not be your virtue, but tenacity is, Matthew said. If you know that, then you must recognize I will find out who she is eventually, Samantha said. All right, Sam, fine. We've got time. I'll play along. Is it Becky? Sam asked. What? Matthew asked. Becky? Seriously, Sam? Oh, wow. I was 90% sure it wasn't, but that's a hard no. Definitely, Matthew confirmed. No possible way. Why? Because it's Becky. Matthew rubbed his forehead. The first time I saw her, she immediately went into the little sister category and has not budged. I did not realize you categorize women when you first meet them, Sam said. She smirked. What category did I fall in when you first met me? Matthew laughed. Very much not the little sister category, or sister of any kind, he admitted. Samantha grinned. I knew that, but I wanted to hear you say it, she said. Well, you got your wish. Matthew rubbed his chin and thought for a moment. Isn't Becky involved with that earthquake guy out west? He asked. I thought that was old news, Sam said. No, I remember her saying something to Jose about him that led me to believe they were still together. I cannot remember his name. His codename is something cool, though. Shakes, Sam joked. Rift, Matthew said. It is definitely Rift. I remember I was envious when I first heard it. I suppose pull is not the most interesting codename, Samantha said. But you do that same motion with your hand all the time when you make a portal, like you are pulling the place you want to get to toward you. All the time? Matthew asked. Yes, Samantha answered. You... Most have done it. No, you must. Yes, Samantha answered. You must have done it at least three dozen times when you were taking care of Task just now. I had no idea, Matthew said. I don't really even need to anymore. Force of habit, I guess. I think it's cute, Samantha said. Does your girlfriend think so, too? Don't know. Have to ask her, Matthew said. So if it's not Becky... One of the women at HQ? Sam asked. I've seen how some of the female soldiers and staff regard you. No, Matthew said. How about Jenny Kenny? Sam asked. Whoa, Sam, she's married with a kid, Matthew said. I'm just asking, Matthew, relax. I did not mean to offend your moral sensibilities. I'd never do that, Sam, Matthew said. I know you wouldn't, Matt, she responded. It's one of the reasons I developed feelings for you twice. That's a really nice compliment. Thank you, Samantha, Matthew said. You're welcome, Matthew, Sam said in return. They sat silently for a while. Maggie was slowly rotating in a clockwise motion in her bubble, and the IV bag above her head was collapsing at a steady rate as it followed her. So she is someone I don't know, then, Samantha eventually said. I think that is fair to say, Matthew said. Just some normal woman, then? No power beyond the ability to win your heart? What if she is? Matthew asked. Sam arched her eyebrows. That would be unexpected, she said. Most children of the outpouring look to pair off with other children of the outpouring. But you are Matthew Ward. You do your own thing. 
Still, I would feel a bit sorry for her. Why? Because she couldn't really keep up with you, Samantha said. And you know the statistics about how difficult it is for children of the outpouring to conceive, so it is very unlikely she'd have a baby to take care of while she waited for you to come home from saving the world and transporting stuff. Fair enough, Matthew said. I like doing it this way, you asking me, Samantha said. Give me another. Okay, let's say she's a child of the outpouring, but she is significantly less powerful than you, Matthew said. Same problem, couldn't keep up with you. What about more powerful than you? That's a small list. I'd figure it out pretty quickly, and you seem confident I won't, so I'm going to say she's not more powerful than me. Matthew thought for a moment, and then decided to be bold. What if it was Maggie? He asked. Samantha's eyes went wide. She sat up straight and turned toward Matthew. Task? She asked. What if I decided that I would dedicate my life to taking care of her, in a spirit of sacrifice, following Jesus' example? Oh God, Matthew, Sam began. That's the sort of noble and spectacularly stupid thing you'd do. But that's an awfully one-sided relationship. And more than a little creepy, if you don't know the context. I don't know if I like that line. I think... And delete that. Matthew smiled at Samantha. Don't worry, Samantha, he said. The relationship I'm in is definitely not one-sided. Then it is definitely not with sleeping psycho over there, Samantha said. Matthew felt a twinge of anger at Sam's comment, but he did not let it show. You could try using her name, Matthew said. After everything she has done, she doesn't deserve a real name, Samantha responded. Have you thought about what you will have to deal with when she wakes up? She's bound to have some very strong feelings about you, Matt. Sam, I can honestly say I've thought about that every day for a while now, Matthew said. I'm prepared to deal with her feelings. I admire your confidence, but this is task we're talking about. She could rip your lady love's mind apart if she wanted. She almost got through your null field, right? She did, and she didn't, Matthew answered. Best way I could describe it is that she got in the door, but couldn't rearrange the furniture. And then you kicked her out, Samantha said as she stared at Matthew. Or she couldn't stay because of the null field is more accurate, correct? It's not like she's just been sitting in your mind all this time. Matthew looked at Samantha intently. She's on my mind every day, Sam, Matthew said. On is not in, Samantha offered. It's not like she is controlling you, or am I talking to Maggie right now? Hey, you used her name, Matthew said with a smile. Look at you acknowledging our guest's humanity. Our prisoner, you mean, Samantha corrected. Well, your prisoner. I'm glad it was you and not me who had to deal with her two years ago. Honestly, Matthew, I cannot think of anyone else who could have beaten her. Samantha considered Maggie for a few moments and then looked back at Matthew. I see the gears turning, Sam, Matthew said. Matthew, I haven't had gears integrated in me for years, Matthew laughed. What are you thinking? he asked. I was thinking that you and Task would make one hell of a power couple, she said. You'd be terrifying. Am I supposed to say thank you? No, Matthew, I'm being serious. You both have unbelievable powers, and you both are so strong. She's been sustaining the phenomenon for two years while she is unconscious, and you've been holding it back all that time, and you're asleep a third of the time you do it. She's a monster, Matt, and you'd be one too if you weren't so... Catholic. Imagine if we had a kid, Matthew said. Samantha shook her head. The world would lose its mind, she said. Brinks would probably go berserk. Matthew grunted. He had to mention the colonel, he complained. Now that is interesting. What? You insist on using proper names for the children of the outpouring, but usually call Brinks the colonel. A touch of hypocrisy, perhaps? Matthew nodded. Fair point, Sam. You're probably right. Colonel Brinks is not my favorite person. The feeling is mutual, I assure you, Samantha said. If you knew how many times I talked him down from dismissing you. Really? Matthew asked. Sam nodded. You do spend a lot of time with him, Sam, Matthew said. Why is that? 
Is there something you need to tell me? She tossed her head back and smiled, then looked at Matthew. Me and Brinks, Matthew? That's worse than you and Becky. Maybe so, but you do respect him an awful lot, and you defer to him more than anyone else on the team does, except maybe for Roy. Samantha glanced down, and then back to Matthew. He's a surrogate father for me, Matt, Samantha said softly. Not a good one, but better than what I had. Matthew put his hand on Samantha's shoulder and squeezed. I get it, Sam. You don't have to say any more, Matthew said. Samantha reached across her body and took Matthew's hand in her own. They sat like that for some time, watching Maggie. When Maggie's IV was nearly empty, Samantha released Matthew's hand. All right, time to go, Samantha said. Matthew nodded. They both stood, and Matthew used his power to carefully remove the IV bag and tube from the sight on Maggie's arm. He tucked them into the small duffel bag, zipped the bag shut, and portaled both bags back to his prep room. He looked at Maggie one last time. God bless you until we meet again, he said. You really say that to her every day, Samantha asked. Every day, Matthew replied. I hope it sinks in for her sake, Samantha said. Otherwise, she'll definitely be feeling the heat after earthly justice catches up to her. Matthew frowned. You know I won't let that happen, Sam, he said. Won't let her go to hell, Samantha asked. Matthew, you're powerful, but you of all people should know you're not God. I won't let her be executed, Matthew said. Samantha took a deep breath. She stared hard at Matthew. I have no doubt you could delay it for a while, Matthew. But in the end, justice is going to be done. Samantha said. Sleeping Maggie will not get a happy ending, even if you... Yeah, I think... I'm hesitating because I want to say R, but I think were makes more sense coming from Samantha. Let's do it again. I have no doubt you could delay it for a while, Matthew, but in the end, justice is going to be done, Samantha said. Sleeping Maggie will not get a happy ending, even if you were her prince. Matthew looked at Maggie for a moment before speaking. Even if you're right, I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do what I can. Sounds better than I'm going to do what I can. I think he's... He thought... Well, he reflected on what he said. Yeah, it still feels more natural to say, I'm going to do what I can. Consequences will be hell on earth for you, Sam said. I know, Matthew said. Doesn't matter. And what does your lady think? Sam asked. Matthew looked at Samantha and smiled faintly. She understands. If that's true, she's either very brave, very foolish, or very much in love, Samantha said. Matthew turned toward Maggie. I don't know about the second one, but I am sure about the first and third ones, he said. She must be something special, Samantha said. Matthew turned back towards Sam. She really is, he said. Ready to fly? Samantha nodded. Matthew extended his power around Samantha and himself, and in mere moments they were soaring out of the phenomenon. The weariness drilled into Matthew again as soon as he crossed the boundary. He looked down at the phenomenon and saw that a knot of trees suddenly burst apart, doubtlessly because of his sudden use of power outside the vicinity of Maggie's bubble. Huh. Should it be his power? I feel like it should be sudden use of his power. He looked down at the phenomenon and saw that a knot of trees suddenly burst apart, doubtlessly because of his sudden use of his power outside the vicinity of Maggie's bubble. The sudden use of his power is better. All right, I think we got it this time. The weariness drilled into Matthew again as soon as he crossed the boundary. He looked down at the phenomenon and saw that a knot of trees suddenly burst apart, doubtlessly because of the sudden use of his power outside the vicinity of Maggie's bubble. Matthew wasted no time in returning Samantha and himself to the jeep near the checkpoint. You mind driving back? He asked Samantha after they landed. Mind, she said. I'd love to. I was never going to give you the keys, Matthew. Matthew hopped in the passenger side of the jeep. It was a slow, quiet ride back. 
Matthew was considering what Samantha had said. She was right about the consequences for loving Maggie, but that did not change Matthew's mind. He was going to ask her to marry him tonight, and he hoped that she would say yes and... and wake up. Matthew felt deep certainty about it. He wanted Maggie to wake up tonight. It was time. You're lost, Matthew, Samantha said as they rounded the corner and neared HQ. I'm thinking about what you were saying before, Matthew said. People pay attention when I talk, but not because I am a compelling speaker, Sam said. Matthew turned to her. Hey, you're more than just a pretty face, remember? She didn't look at him, but she smiled. It was a beautiful, unguarded smile. You're trying to distract me, Samantha said. I know you were thinking about her, your lady love. I'm not trying to distract you, but yes, you're right, I was thinking of her too, Matthew admitted. Sam pulled the car near the loading bay entrance, put it in park, and turned off the engine. I need to do that more often, she said. Drive? Yes, but with good company. Take Brinks, Matthew joked. Give Becky a kiss for me, Samantha countered. Matthew winced. Okay, you win that round, he said. Sam raised her hand and flicked her finger as if to keep score. All right, she said. You need to clean up and change for your sister's party. I do indeed. And I need to pick up Jose early to take him to the florist. Have fun at the party. Wish Faustina a happy birthday for me. Thank you. I will, Matthew said. Samantha offered him a smile, then got out of the car and made her way to the base. Matthew said a prayer for her, that God would bring her deep and lasting happiness. Then he exited the car, opened a portal, and stepped through. Thank you so much for watching part two of chapter four of my Catholic non-woke superhero novel, Task. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're on Rumble, please follow. If you're on either one, please leave a comment and a like. I really appreciate it. It goes a long way toward helping me to get this project more visible and to make it better. Once again, thank you so much. God bless you. Ooh, ancient province.